Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about bacteria, and in particular, I'd like to talk to you about how bacteria transfer their genetic material from one bacteria to another, and there's three ways to do that. Before we start getting into um, the detail of the types of genetic recombination of bacteria, let's talk about a little bit of why this is an important idea for bacteria to have the ability to do this. And so let's jump right into this conversation. And so let's say, for example, right out of the gate, one of the most important things to consider about bacteria is that they have such a short generation uh, span, a short generation time. So in optimal conditions, this is, we're talking about 37 degrees, plenty of food. Um, we're talking about 30 to 40 minutes a bacteria will be able to grow and divide into two daughter cells, which are clones. And so this short generation time and the ability for them to mutate often allows them to adapt to changing environments really well. And so this is how they do it most. This is how they're most successful, is that they're extremely adaptable bacteria. I mean, they, they could take anything. You could throw, change change temperatures, you can change different environmental conditions, you can throw antibiotics at them, and some of them are going to make it through. And it's because of mutation rate and short generation time and their ability to swap genetic material. And so in a true sense, in an evolutionary sense, their ability to adapt uh, via natural selection is because they're very good at adjusting to changes in their environment. And so Let's take a look at this. It all comes down to the genetic material. Most of the DNA inside of a bacteria is in this one big chromosome, which is clustered together in the center called a nucleoid. And there's, you know, you might think there's a lot of genes on a bacteria. There's around 4,000 or so genes in a typical bacteria. We have approximately 23,000 genes. And so it's quite a few more. But then again, they have a lot more than a typical virus. So what's interesting, in addition to that chromosome of DNA, they also have these circular sort of rubber band uh, small quantities of DNA in their cytoplasm called plasmids, or sort of like um, rubber bands if you're wearing braces that would hold your, your, uh, your teeth together. And so these rubber bands are these plasmids of DNA or small rings of DNA, and they often carry just a few genes. Some are, are, are carried for resistance to antibiotics. So it's kind of cool that if they have that, cool if it's a bacteria. Some of them even have genes on them for producing the pili, which are those finger-like extensions on bacteria that allow them to sexually reproduce or conjugate with other bacteria. So those are called F plasmids if they have that for fertility, and R plasmids if they carry resistant genes. In a future conversation, we'll talk about how plasmids are very useful uh, to biotechnology. We've been able to pull plasmids out of bacteria and cut them with restriction enzymes and include uh, foreign DNA into them and use them as a, as a vector uh, to transfer uh, genetic material to one uh, bacteria and then clone them up so we can uh, amplify bacteria using plasmids. So plasmids are really, really, really important in biotechnology, and they're really important to the bacteria. They just have a few genes, but they're crucial ones. So this may be a review, but when a bacteria, remember I said it only lives around 30, day, 30 minutes before it replicates, and so it's getting busy. There's one origin of replication site. DNA polymerase comes down, attaches, and starts replicating. Here's the replication fork here, and it copies its DNA into two. And you may recall that it once the DNA is replicated, it simply attaches it to the membrane, and then when those membrane increase in size, both copies of the DNA move along, and then the cell's good to divide through binary fission. It doesn't have to do the whole mitotic thing. It has no nucleus. It doesn't need spindle fibers. It's really simple. gets the job done. It's very efficient. And so bacteria, if anything, are very prolific. They reproduce... And since there's a lot of them, their growth rate is rather rapid. And so it's like a lot of them, and they grow really quickly. So there's a, 
the exponential growth increase can be really dramatic. And so you can see here in just a few minutes, they can increase um, quite a few. And then if you give them like a half day, they can go even further. And so our whole body's covered with these. And a lot of, I mean, this is not a, necessarily a great thought, but a lot of our feces contains bacteria uh, in there. And so, as I mentioned before, they reproduce through binary fission. And uh, one of the things about this is that when they reproduce, their DNA polymerase, though quick, is not very good at proofreading. There's not a lot of bacteria that have proofreading DNA polymerases. And you're like, well, I guess not as good. Now, actually, this is the key to the bacterial success. The fact that they make spontaneous mutations, in other words, errors in replication, um, allows for a tremendous diversity of bacteria, or else they would simply be clones of one another. And so, check this out. This means that uh, if a spontaneous mutation rate is 1 in every 10 to the 7 mutations per gene uh, per cell division, that means 2,000 bacteria in our intestine are going to have a mutation per day. So that's a, that's a way in which to generate diversity. And so this is really, really important. And so new mutations, though individually rare, if you think, overall, can have a significant impact on genetic diversity, especially when the reproductive rates are high and it's a short generation span. And so bacteria use mutation and a rapid increase in their numbers through short generation time to be adapted to their changing environments. And so to contrast that, we as eukaryotic organisms, we do have mutations and we do have new alleles, but we um, we don't have such a quick generation tur turnaround. And so how we uh, increase diversity in the next generation is through uh, sexual reproduction. So we use meiosis to sort of um, swap genes in our own cells in the production of gametes, and then sexual reproduction reprodu in general uh, shuffles the deck between uh, the DNA. And so sexual recombination is the way eukaryotes do it, and mutation and high uh, reproductive rates are the way bacteria do it. And so let's talk about those three ways in which uh, genetic material can be re recombined in bacteria. It's really important because if there is a mutation, maybe they want to share it with other bacteria. And this is the way bacteria can recombine DNA with other bacteria. You might not think it's possible because let me just sort of just state this, the situation here. Here's one bacteria and here's a separate one. So what I'm talking about is like normally the DNA will replicate itself into two and then the cell will divide and then this cell and the cell are complete clones from this one cell. And so, you know, that's great. So if there's a mutation, maybe there's some change in the, in the population. But what I'm, what I'm talking about is, like, if you have a, a bacteria here, and I'm talking about a different bacteria here, how can DNA exchange from one bacteria to another? And there's three ways in which it can take place. One is your good old transformation. In other words, if you remember this, like the cell can break open and some of the genetic material can simply just come out like this. If I was able to draw it, let's go a different color here. Let's say the genetic material were to come out, maybe if I did a pen it would be better. So DNA can come out here in between cells and then it can be incorporated and then it causes this cell to become transformed. So that's one way. Transduction involves a bacteriophage and when a bacteria, I'll go over this in detail in a moment, when a bacteriophage injects its DNA and it starts taking over the cell, sometimes by accident it will actually incorporate some of the bacterial DNA in its capsid and so when the cell lysis it goes over here and when it infects a different cell what it's doing is actually inserting like a syringe foreign DNA from a different bacterial and that's called transduction. And then conjugation, if you watched the previous video on bacteria you kind of know where this is going. Some bacteria have these extensions called pili 
and the DNA can actually travel through these extensions from one to another. So this is sort of like sexual reproduction in bacteria conjugation. So there's three ways in which bacteria can genetically recombine their DNA with other bacteria to produce new strains. Which is, we'll look at some examples of why that might be an important too. And here's an example of that. Say, for example, you're growing E. coli or any other bacteria in a test tube. And you have some sort of nutrient in here, some sort of media. Let's say it's minimal media. And there's a, a mutant strain that, do you see, notice here it's tryptoph tryptophan, or it's, yeah, tryptophan negative, meaning that it cannot produce tryptophan. And if it cannot produce tryptophan, Sorry, you're out of luck. If it's not in the food, you're gonna you're not gonna be able to live, and so no colonies. <laughs> so sorry. And then over here, look at this mutant. This one is um, arginine negative, meaning that it, it cannot grow in minimal media. Now, of course, if you gave it ar arginine, it would grow. And over here, if you gave it tryptophan, it would grow. But check this out. If you take the the two bacteria and you put them in the same medium, and they're able to to grow in here sometimes there's a genetic exchange of DNA. And so there's some colonies that will actually pick up a little DNA from the other bacteria. And as a result, this one, when, you're, when it grows on middle, minimal media, it is able to grow because, interestingly enough, it picked up sort of the, the goodness of this one and the goodness of that one. And so therefore, it's sort of like you know, a nice couple that's in a symbiotic relationship relationship of mutualism. This one provides a little something good and this one a little something good. So there, there's a great example of why recombining DNA with other bacteria could be useful. And so let's, let me refresh you with transformation. We've been through this a couple times, but this is Fred Griffith's classic experiment when he's killing mice over here. And you remember the dead, heat-killed S lost some of its DNA and it got incorporated into the R, which then transformed into the S, which killed the bacteria. And so that's an example of transformation. And it's simply the movement of and some DNA or some alleles are replaced by the foreign transfer of DNA and therefore it's incorporated. And so this cell is now able to, to produce a protein uh, produce resistance, produce a protein capsid, a sugar capsule. So it's able to do things that it's never been able to do. It's been transformed. And so that's basic. In other words, just diffusion of nucleic acid from one bacteria to another. What's interesting about that is that there's a few bacteria that are particularly good at that. They have proteins that it will be able to take up naked DNA. But as it turns out, E. coli, which is one of the more highly studied modeled prokaryotes, funny, but it doesn't do that really well. And so we have learned uh, an, a technique that we use in the lab often to make E. coli receptive to taking in foreign DNA. And so we've learned that if we treat the E. coli, if we grow E. coli prior to a transformation with calcium ions, calcium chlorides, rather simple salt, we've learned that that makes them more receptive to taking up the DNA. We call that making them competent. So we can make E. coli competent by giving them some calcium chloride. And so what we do is we grow the E. coli with some calcium chloride. And what we think is happening is that the calcium chloride, when it's in solution, uh, disassociates into calcium ions. And we believe that those cations um, adhere to the phosphate groups along the DNA chain and therefore make it a little bit more neutral, therefore maybe make it a little bit easier for it to be taken in by E. coli. And then this other uh, way in which bacteria can transform genetic material is transduction, and that's by using a phage, sort of like as a mosquito vector. And so it, there's going to be two kinds of transductions, general and specific. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about general first. It's when, let me go over here and sort of show you, here's a typical phage that's injecting its DNA into a bacteria. And so let's go here. What I want to do is show you on this board here something that's going on. So here's E. coli. 
here is the phage. And so the phage is attaching here. And what it does is it injects its DNA into the host. And so when it does that, if you recall, one of the enzymes that the, the phage carries is an enzyme that sort of dices up the nucleic acid of the uh, bacteria. And that way, it doesn't have to compete so much with that. And so when it's doing that, another thing that's simultaneously happening is that it's making more viral capsids. And I'll just do this like this, making more viruses. And so what's supposed to happen is it, the, the phages do this. They put their own DNA once it's been replicated in here. But sometimes by mistake, they'll put a little piece of bacterial genetic material inside the protein capsule. And so when the virus uh, and ends up destroying the bacteria and the cell lysises, and all these little phages come out, um, what can happen is, for example, this one can go over here and infect another bacteria. And, and when it does that, it's not going to destroy the bacteria. But in fact, you can sort of see this. It infects it by inserting a little piece of this bacteria's DNA. So this is called generalized transduction because, you know, who's to say if that's going to even happen? And who's going to say what gene is going to get incorporated into the phage? So it's totally random. So it's generalized. But the truth is, this bacteria is going to have a novel um, ability that it never had before because the virus helped to um, genetically recombine these two bacteria's genomes. And so let me talk a little bit about specific transduction right now. And this is really cool. Like here's E. coli. Here again is the phage that's attaching to it like this. And so when the phage DNA goes in, Here's the bacterial chromosome like this. And so do you recall there's a phage called landophage? And what happens is when its DNA is, is inserted into the bacteria, its DNA becomes incorporated into the host DNA like that. And so it becomes a prophage. And so this is known as a temperate virus. The DNA lays latent. It can be copied many times. And then what's interesting is something causes the DNA to the prophage to, to release itself. And when it, when it releases itself from the bacterial chromosome in future generations, sometimes when it's excised from the chromosome, it actually pulls away a little bit of the bacterial DNA with it. So here it is, beep, 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 breaking up like this. And so what's interesting is if I were to attach um, letters to this and say this is gene A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, uh, you get the point. So the reason this is called specialized transduction is that it's not random which piece of DNA is incorporated into the phage. It's the one that's adjacent to the prophage, which is often the one that's going to get incorporated. And so I hope that's clear. And then what happens is this is what happens in the next phage. And so a little piece of DNA is able to move over to the next bacteria. Let's go over here back to our slideshow if we can. And so here is an actual picture of a phage infecting a bacteria. So in specialized transduction, it involves a tempered phage. The prophage inserts itself into the bacterial chromosome. And as you can see over here, here's the prophage. It's kind of small. But when the prophage removes itself from the chromosome, it's carrying a little piece of DNA with it from the bacteria, as you can see here. That's A+. Plus. And so when it infects a future bacteria, it brings that A+, plus along. And then over here, in general, it comes in splices up the, the DNA, and then just randomly picks up a piece. Um, and so those are the two side by side. And then finally, the third way in which bacteria can transmit or genetically recombine their DNA with another bacteria is if one has pili. So you see this one has a lot of pili on it. Do you remember? There's the pili. 
this is kind of slightly humorous. The bacteria that have pili are considered to be male because they have these bridges that will allow DNA to exchange across. And so here is a picture of bacteria reproducing or conjugating. <laughs> and so the male one is sending DNA over into the female, and the female receives the, the DNA through the, the sex pellis <laughs> between the bridge between the two bacteria. And so there you have it. The three ways in which genetic material is exchanged between bacteria. So high mutation rate, high reproductive rate, short generation time, transformation, transduction, and conjugation make for bacteria to be extremely adaptable and therefore, no doubt, the most successful organisms on this earth. This earth has ever seen in 3.5 billion years. So I hope hopeful. Hopefully that was helpful and you enjoyed it as well. Thanks for watching.